Starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening and welcome to this evening's webinar. Hello, I'm Mark Jones and I'll be the uh, part facilitator and part presenter for tonight. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to say that there are daily pro points uh, available for tonight's uh, webinar. And if you'd just like to uh, put this into the, the questions tab and um, Katie Forley from AHDB uh, can get back in touch with you uh, and ask for a few more details. Um, the questions tab and buttons should be on the right hand side of the screen. Um, Jim Gibbs tonight will talk for approximately 40 minutes and then we'll have questions afterwards. So if you'd like to put some questions in the box on the right hand side as we're going or just at the end. Um, again, I apologise for the slight delay with a little bit of technical difficulty. So um, moving on to the series of webinars, um, they've actually been jointly sponsored by AHDB, Field Options, Momont and KWS. Uh, in terms of field options, they're a grass and forage seed specialist and have been developing beet grazing systems in the UK for about 17 years and currently have four grazing varieties on offer. Mamont is based in northeast France and are breeders of dual purpose grazing fodder beet. And KWS are a major breeder of sugar beets and fodder beet in Europe. And uh, they're actually bringing in crop establishments, um, high technology seed production as well. Okay, so tonight we'll be talking about fodder beet grazing systems for, for dairy cattle. Uh, this is the third in a series of five webinars. So the first was transition of cattle, sheep um, to fodder beet. The second one was beef. Tonight will be dairy. On the 2nd of November, we've got uh, sheep. And finally, on the 9th of November, we've got agronomy. Uh, this series will also be run in Wales in the next couple of weeks. So moving on, uh, in terms of the speakers tonight, um, we have got uh, Rhys Owen up on one of the, the PowerPoints, but unfortunately he couldn't make it tonight, but he's a specialist in agronomy uh, of grass and forage crops and fodder beet, and uh, he works for field options. Uh, we've got myself, Mark Jones, so I'm an independent grass and forage consultant. I work with a lot of farmers grazing fodder beet and have several project farms uh, this winter. We also farm and out winter around 350 dairy beef, um, which we've been doing for about five years. And prior to that, we were doing a similar system on fodder beet with R1 and R2 dairy heifers. And finally, uh, we've got Dr. Jim Gibbs. So he's a research scientist in ruminant nutrition at Lincoln University in New Zealand. He's also a trained uh, uh, veterinarian. And over the last 10 years, much of his research has concentrated on fodder beet. He's been the main driver in increasing great beet from 10 hectares to 70,000 hectares over this period in New Zealand. So I'd just like to welcome Jim Gibbs and uh, pass over to you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Mark, for the introduction and uh, welcome to the UK uh, listeners this evening. Um, I'm I'm pleased to be here and looking forward to this, the next dairy instalment in this webinar series. So uh, what we'll do tonight in terms of our outline, we're going to discuss the direct grazing of beet uh, by both mixed age dairy cows and uh, in calf heifers. We'll also look at um, the lactation feeding which will normally mean using the beet at a lower level. The, the dry cow and in calf dairy heifer grazing is using beet as a primary diet. Lactation feeding is usually using as a supplement to either pasture or pasture mixed rations. We'll look at the uh, calf uh, grazing directly on beet across that autumn and winter, and we'll discuss some of the common uh, troubleshooting issues and the myths to avoid. So we'll start first and foremost with the, uh, the background around beet. The question that we've that we've uh, raised here is how does fodder beet really fit uh, UK dairy systems? And there's a few reasons why it's an actual fit, particularly to pasture-based systems and particularly to spring block carving systems. And the first of these is that it's the highest yielding crop that can be achieved. 
And that we'll see has a few uh, knock-on effects and we'll, we'll come back to that uh, several times this evening through the webinar. But um, the largest crops in New Zealand now are over 40 tonnes and it's very common to grow crops over 30 tonnes of dry matter a hectare. So it means that there's a small area that can be used, but a very large amount of uh, feed that's grown, which means that the control of that feed security can be brought back onto the farm. The other issues with beet and the features of the crop that lend itself to dairy applications are, it's a consistently high ME value, so 12 and above, and it holds that value uh, right through the season. Utilisation in the grazing systems with beet is very different to brassicas, and the utilisation is a whole lot higher uh, very commonly above 95%. It's a straightforward process to use and because it's a high yielding crop, it can be a very cheap crop to grow. So in terms of the uh, local UK costs, this can work out down to about 5p per kilogram dry matter. And that's a lot as we'll see uh, in this following slide. That can be a lot cheaper, particularly on an ME basis than uh, any of the competing feeds. So uh, if, if we were picking at the moment wheat at about 180 pounds a tonne or maize silage at say 130, grass silage maybe a little cheaper than that and whole crop silage is um, perhaps a little bit more expensive. Even uh, straw at the moment, uh, the prices that are being charged at 130 a tonne but even in normal cases down to 80, uh, 80 pounds a tonne, you can see that beet is a much cheaper uh, replacement. And the really high ME and the very high fermentable carbohydrate loading beet mean that it's effectively a one-on-one -on -one replacement for cereal grain in the systems where it's used. And we're not gonna spend a lot of time talking tonight on total mixed ration use of um, sugar beet or fodder beet or when it's included in those rations, but there has been a reasonable amount of work done in recent times looking at the effect of that when it's replacing starch in the diet. Uh, particularly with um, Dr. Benedita Saldias uh, in New Zealand, who's been uh, spending some time in review of this area. And the broad consensus over this is that there's a relatively small change in um, milk fat or milk protein. But <clears throat> there's a very similar metabolizable energy and protein content between the beet and the grain, but at a much lower cost. So the real advantage in that system comes down to cost again. The other important component in forage based systems particularly is that it works with the season in as much as that because it's typically spring sown, it's using the heat units in spring and summer to bank really high ME feed for use in the following autumn, winter and even into that spring. And it is reasonably flexible in that while wherever possible we prefer to graze it and do so, there's various options around harvesting. Now some of the harvesting the UK audience would be well familiar with and that would be the standard sugar beet harvesting where it's lifted commercially in the bulb without the leaf can be stored. And that has its advantages in certain systems. But one of the New Zealand innovations that's very common, far more common than commercial harvesting now, is the use of beet buckets. And beet buckets are a very simple apparatus that can remove the fodder beet directly out of the ground. Um, it's a very cheap option and it works out around about one P a kilogram dry matter in the medium term. So it means that it's a very cheap feed that's flexible enough to be fed out on paddock or to be grazed directly or included in a ration. Now, I'll just refer back to the first of these webinars that we did where we spent a bit more time talking about the crop itself. But because we're going to talk about uh, direct grazing and the need for transition, I'll just reiterate one single slide from that. The, the features of the crop that are of most importance when we come to actually graze them are the fact that it is a very high energy uh, crop that has a really high sucrose component, it can be 50% of the dry matter. Now, as a consequence, it's got a really high fermentable carbohydrate load and therefore has to be treated effectively like cracked grain. Now, it, it also has a, a strong disparity between the material that's in the leaf and the material that's in the bulb. In an agronomically well-grown crop for fodder beet grazing, and we'll come back to that, but that agronomy is different to the traditional sugar beet agronomy to produce these fit for purpose grazing crops. But in an agronomically well treated crop for grazing, the leaf material will be 20 or 25% of the total dry matter of the plant. Now that leaf really contains all of the protein and most of the minerals that are of importance to us in terms of dairy production. For example, calcium, phosphorus, 
In the bowl, uh, it has a relatively low crude protein. In some cases, it can be very low, but it is where all the energy uh, is maintained. Now, that means uh, because we, uh, for a grazing diet, we have to include the leaf and the bulb together, that the crop's never set stocked, but it's always strip grazed. And in doing that, it means we've got control and we get a much higher utilisation. But it also means that we balance the amount of leaf and the amount of bulb in the diet every day. So with that, we'll move to um, our first uh, livestock class, which is to graze either the mixed age uh, adult dairy cows as dry cows or the in-calf heifers um, prior to first calving. And the, the overview of this is simply to say that the way that beet is used in this fashion is to use it as a total diet effectively with a, a relatively small amount of anything else included in the diet. Um, it's quite a dependable you know, intake rule that cattle, well transitioned cattle that are at their maximum unrestricted beet intakes will eat about 2.2% of their live weight. So if we look at a standard 550 kilo um, midwinter weight for a dry cow, then that means that our intake will be, depending on the size, somewhere between 11 or a maximum of about 12 kilograms of dry matter of beet intake and with that there's a minimum of two kilograms of some other component in the diet consumed. Now that, that may well mean that there has to be more allocated and we'll come back to that in a minute but that is to be consumed. Now the, 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 that diet is then maintained across the whole of the winter and then they're taken off that diet uh, prior to calving. Now what that practically means given the cost of beet from the previous slides and including the cost of whatever other supplement is involved in this and it could be pasture, it could be silage, it could be hay. <clears throat> but the total cost of the diet is uh, very cheap. So that wintering diet cost can be uh, brought down really quickly and that has been the driver for the uptake of beet in the New Zealand dairy industry. The other component is two, in particular, two drivers of this are that it's the highest body condition score gain forage that we have available. So it, it's possible to put on a, a large amount of live weight in a relatively short time. And so that the body condition change that can be expected before calving when they're on unrestricted beet intakes can be really high. So it's not uncommon to achieve a full body condition score change in a slightly longer winter and uh, very common to do half, half a body condition score change in the dry period prior to spring calving. Now, as a, as a general rule, they eat approximately in, in a in a typical wintering dry cow arrangement, they eat approximately one ton of dry matter. So the stocking rate really reflects the crop yields. And that means it's, it's slightly more than one animal per ton. So that means that the stocking rate is relatively high. Now that means in a winter scenario that there's a protective effect on areas of the farm that aren't in crop. So animals are removed from a larger area of the farm and put onto a smaller area of the farm uh, over that uh, more challenging period and relatively small areas put into crop can carry very high uh, stocking rates across the whole of that uh, challenging autumn and winter period. <clears throat> so we're going to do now some uh, practical uh, transition onto the crop. So reiterating that what we're doing in this case is we're transitioning them onto beet, grazing beet in this case as a, um, as a primary diet with a relatively small input of something else. Now, the first and most important part of transition is that, as mentioned in the previous slide, we're dealing with a very high fermentable carbohydrate uh, crop. So as a consequence, the, it, it's a necessity to have this extended transition and there's nothing that can be done that will reduce that transition under 14 days. Uh, I, I suggest that for the people who are more interested in detail around that, that you return to the first webinar we did in this series where we did transition in much more detail. But the, the important component around transition to make it work and to be successful is to make sure that the paddock design is good. And we spoke at some length in the first webinar about some of the aspects of that, and I won't reiterate all of them, but what I would say is there's uh, two things in particular that make transition possible. And they are the space along the line so making sure that there's one linear meter for every animal along that line, uh, the hot wire for the, for the beat itself, and the space behind that line in the form of a headland 
or at least a headland or a sacrifice paddock next door. And for that headland, it has to be a minimum of about six metres. If that's less than that, then what you find, and for both of those uh, parameters, what you find is that the lighter and the shyer animals get squeezed away from the face. So even though your allocation on a per animal basis for the whole mob can be correct, your access for them is not right. And in that case, a small group of that population will eat a lot more and a small group won't eat anything at all for a while. Now, as the allocation gets higher and higher and higher through that transition, eventually there'll be space for the late entrance to eat and then they adapt very, very quickly. So they get onto that feed far quicker than they could. So the original overeaters are a problem and the original undereaters are also a problem. And both of them can be controlled by space. Now, the second component about transition as a practical point of view is that you can't allocate that crop and you need to, you'll see in the subsequent slides, but you can't allocate that crop unless you understand what the crop yield is. And that yield uh, has a tremendous variability in most paddocks. So again, I refer back to the first webinar where we discussed methods to establish what the actual crop yield was at the face that you're using. But the important component about that is that it's done uh, properly and thoroughly because it's a very important component with transition. It can't be done without it. And I also suggest that it's done using real dry matters rather than uh, estimates of dry matters of the crop from previous years or from neighbours, etc. That dry matter can vary a lot and that therefore changes your yields and, and your allocation a lot. And that can be a, a problem in uh, mixed stage dairy cows. They are by far the most susceptible livestock class to some of the issues around transition. So the practical um, transition is that we would start mixed stage dairy cows and in-calf heifers on one to two kilograms of dry matter on day one. And that um, we'll, we'll return in a moment to an exception to that if they've been uh, in lactation feeding in the autumn being fed beet. But assuming that they haven't, they'd start at one to two kilograms of dry matter on day one. And they would not be moved to increase that allocation on subsequent days until uh, the farmer was confident that the entire group were all eating the bulb. So I'll just reiterate that all of the animals will eat the leaf. And if they're not being watched carefully, you can very easily get a small population in there who are lazy and won't take to that bulb. And that automatically means there's the same size subpopulation that will eat double. Now at one to two kilograms, that's not a problem. But when you get up to five kilograms, that's a big problem. So what would happen is they'd start at that one to two kilograms and then they'd not be moved off that until the entire mob is eating that bulb. Now, once they are eating that bulb, then typically the increase after that is pretty steady and relatively rapid. So they move up one kilogram of dry matter every second day. So if you did your sums on that, in most cases, that means at the end of about 14 days, they're approaching their maximum intakes. They're at about 10 kilograms. And in the days shortly after that, they'd be at uh, what we would term ad libitum or unrestricted beet intakes. Now, it's really important to remember that if you're going to restrict the beet intake over that period, then they still have to have uh, a primary diet. They still have to have a complete diet. And that will mean if they're on one to two kilograms of beet as dry matter, that you have to fill in the rest of their diet. Now, if that doesn't happen, then uh, hungry animals put a lot more pressure on the hot wire and they eat in a different fashion. So they don't regulate their intake well. They don't learn to regulate their intake as well. They eat uh, in a much more aggressive fashion. So it shouldn't be underestimated the, uh, the value of the supplement in that transition policy. Now, there's two things with that, with the supplement, is the type and the access of it, and then the timing. Now, in general terms, what would happen with the supplement in most cases is that in the first week, it's fed out at about seven to eight kilograms of dry matter a cow and it would be held for that across that first week. Uh, the cheapest way to do that, because in that early period, more supplements being used. So the cheapest way to do that is to have uh, grazed pasture as a major component of that. And then um, another component of, for example, uh, hay or um, silage, or whatever you're going to use throughout the whole of that wintering period. In the second week, that would drop down to about four kilograms. And we'll, we'll talk about bale feeders in a moment because they're harder to use on this. And that would run through to the end of the second week. And, and thereafter, it would be two kilograms minimum consumed. That might mean putting more than two kilograms out. It will in most cases, but it's two kilograms consumed. Now, the access to this is important. 
uh, in the early part where more supplements being fed, it's usually less of a problem. But as you get to the second week and particularly uh, the, the feeding after that, it's, it's quite easy to confuse uh, allocation with access. So for example, and in the example of the slides we've got there, uh, this particular farmer's got uh, two medium rounds of about 200 kilos of dry matter uh, in each. Now, you know, potentially, if, if we would keep the math simple, then each one of those would feed 100 cows the two kilograms of supplement consumed that they needed. Well, pretty clearly, you're not going to get 100 cows around a bale feeder. So uh, if you're going to use bale feeders, then you automatically have to increase the amount of supplement that's fed out. And in most cases, you'll double it, sometimes even more than double it. Now, in, in dairy cows, we're not normally chasing the maximum intake, so we're not uh, automatically concerned about the amount of supplement that they eat, because as they eat more supplement, they eat less beef. But it is worth pointing out that the discrepancy in price means that you increase the total cost of your winter feed, and uh, that's a significant change in winter feeding in New Zealand, and it's a similar figure calculated in the UK. So for example, if they're being fed even two kilograms more than they need to be fed of that grass silage across the whole of the winter period, then it increases their total wintering costs by about 30%. So it moves their total cost from 10 or 12p up to about 18p. So it's a significant cost and that's the issue with um, supplements. So the classic way that those supplements will be fed out is to be spread out wherever possible. And uh, although the allocation can be a little lower, <clears throat> it means that the access is a lot higher. Excuse me. Now, in the photo, we have their, their uh, animals at the end of their transition period. <clears throat> so what you can see is that uh, these uh, cattle at the time that the lines to be moved the next day have a significant amount of beet under their feet from the day before. Now, at that point, they've achieved unrestricted intakes. And if we were looking at the beef animals where we want to drive the absolute maximum intakes to get the highest returns, then we have to include beet left on the ground for several days behind them. We don't typically do that with um, mixed age dairy cows or in calf heifers. We don't have to achieve the absolute maximum intakes. Their, their gains are very good on, um, on the strong intakes you get if there's even an amount left behind every day when you're going to move that line uh, to the next break. So that would mean that their diet, as we've described, it will be somewhere between 10 or 12 kilograms of dry matter a beet, and then uh, two kilograms fed out if they're being fed under a line or um, double that, or at least four kilograms if they're fed out in bale feeders. And then that's just simply to give enough access. One thing to note with that supplement in bale feeders is if you put the supplement there, they'll eat it. There's a, there's a, a strong um, misinformation that's around there that they'll eat the right amount. They just know how much they're going to eat and they'll eat the right amount. No, it's much easier for them to eat silage and they'll eat it anyway. And if they eat more silage, it does affect their body condition score gain. So if, you, if you're if you chasing higher intakes and higher body conditions, condition score gains, then you really do have to restrict that supplement. So what problems do you run into? Well, that's really easy. It's acidosis. So on our list of 10, we'll say the first eight of them are acidosis. And the, we said before that dairy cows as a livestock class are the single most prone group to rumen acidosis if they're mismanaged. There's no reason to have any acidosis at all if they're managed well, but they're bred to eat, they achieve high intakes relatively fast. So they'll achieve the capacity for full beat intakes at about day seven, but the body and the rumen and their head is not adapted for full intakes until after day 14. So it's the responsibility of the farmer to manage that process. They won't regulate themselves and stock losses can be extraordinary where this is mismanaged. So uh, acidosis is a completely preventable animal health issue. I wanna be really clear on that. Acidosis only occurs when they are transitioning up to unrestricted intakes. At the time that they're at unrestricted intakes and beyond, even with changes in supplement or withdrawal of supplement, et cetera, you cannot provoke acidosis in these animals. The, the major part of that transition change is not actually the rumen and not actually the systems outside the rumen that deal with the water. The number one transition change over that period is that the animal learns a rate of intake. They learn how fast to shovel the coal into the boiler to keep it optimal. And once they learn that, they keep it for the season. So you can see the animals in the picture there. 
a, um, a large amount of beat, 25% of the yesterday's break still under their feet before the break the next day. Now, none of these animals will be any way, shape or form affected by that. It's a very positive way to feed them. If you restrict feed them so you don't have that, you change that intake pattern. So you can wobble that intake pattern in them if you restrict feed them as a, a misguided means of trying to reduce the amount of um, acidosis problems that you may have by reducing the dry matter intake over the day. It's their pattern of intake that is changed over that transition period to avoid acidosis. Now, the supplement management in the transition process can be really important uh, for the reasons we've said with access. If they don't get a full diet over that period, they'll be hungry. They also change their intake pattern. They often put a lot more pressure on the standards. You can see the standards in the picture there are beet special standards that have a hot um, shaft. So they have a boot to go into the ground, but the whole of the, the standard that's there in front of you is a hot steel shaft. So in that case, um, uh, it helps because they can't knock posts over. But really, they only put pressure on the line if your total diet, your management of their total diet in that transition period is bad. They, there's no requirement for animals to be doing so. So that supplement management, giving the right amount, making sure they all have access to it and it's palatable, and they'll be eating that in addition to the beet over that period is a critical component. Now, there's two other issues that are talked with, with uh, carving, really, and that is in certain phosphorus deficiency and um, over body condition score targets, which not uncommonly would produce metabolic issues around carving. Now, in certain soil types, um, phosphorus deficiency in the, in the beet plant can be an issue. They usually are in high production animals where agronomically there's very little leaf in the crop that they've um, been put on to graze in certain environments where phosphorus tends to be low in the plant anyway, and where the supplement that they're being fed doesn't have any green material, so it's neither pasture nor silage, but it might be something like straw or poor quality hay. So phosphorus deficiency uh, over that uh, winter period will normally manifest itself after carving, uh, not before carving. You won't notice anything before carving, but after carving. And it would show in two ways. Typically, one, there's a, a greater increase in the total number of milk fever cases. And two, there's some very specific signs in these downer cows called uh, creeper cows. So it's a characteristic feature of uh, phosphorus deficiency that's been produced that what will happen is that these animals appear like down uh, milk fever cows, but they're quite bright and alert. They just can't get up. They respond a little, not very well, but they respond a little to the typical milk fever treatments, but they tend to be up and down for a few days. They're termed creeper cows and they're relatively straightforward to diagnose. Phosphorus deficiency is easy to mitigate and it's mitigated in the New Zealand system with the simple application of um, phosphorus in the form of dicalcium phosphorus almost exclusively uh, put across the supplementary feed that they're feeding. If they're grazing grass, it's very um, uncommon to have uh, any issues with phosphorus. So typically good quality supplement can get around that as well. Then the other one is if their body condition score on the scale of one to 10 is uh, approaching 5.5 at carving. Our mixed age target for um, most herds is five and 5.5 in the in-calf heifers. But if the mixed age cows are sort of approaching 5.5 and that's not um, hard to do on B because it's capacity to put on condition is so much stronger, then <clears throat> that's that period before carving the so-called springer period before carving becomes much more critical to control metabolics. Uh, and those overfat animals can be more of a challenge to control and that spring nutrition has to be very careful in that period, make sure that they're restricted on the amount of potassium they have. So for example, fresh grass, and uh, to make sure that their um, metabolizable energy in that spring diet is reduced down to maintenance or slightly below maintenance for about 14 days immediately prior to carving. If we were to pick um, the main drivers of um, problems in transition, uh, nearly all of them would go back to preparation. So we've already mentioned the role of uh, design and in most cases that translates simply into not having the two spaces that they need along the crop and behind the wire. The second one would be that the yield assessments and therefore the allocations are poor. So bad yield assessments, um, particularly in the early days in New Zealand were responsible for a lot of stock losses.
that they would be uh, wildly, wildly underestimated and therefore over allocated. Um, the other one with allocation is that it's just either lazy or sometimes just negligent. And <clears throat> pharma patients is tested a little bit because a 14 day uh, adaptation period is not what's required with nearly every other crop. So the, the early learnings in New Zealand were, well, perhaps we don't need this and we can speed it up to a week. Well, you can't and uh, there's, there's significant problems in animal health if you do. And we've also mentioned the role that supplement plays in it. And it's always important to remember that uh, that allocation and access are not the same thing. And if you were to rank the issue with supplements in uh, dairy animals, as opposed to beef animals, the, the, the classic issue with the dairy supplements is that they're, ac they're accessed away from it. That the way that it's put out for them means that there's a significant proportion of the group who get none at all. So now we'll move from there to lactation feeding. Um, so lactation feeding has some, uh, some different principles. Um, of course, the advantage of it are similar to what we, the reasons we would use it in knitting, in the sense that it's a low cost feed and it's very high ME. But the fact is that it's a relatively low crude protein. So the, the classic whole plant crude protein will be 11 to 13%. So that can be a very good match with pastures, which are often particularly in the, the times when we would use them in spring and autumn at the shoulders of the season, the, uh, often the pastures are relatively high crude protein, excess nitrogen. So there's a, a neat fit for having a relatively lower crude protein, high energy feed, makes use of the nitrogen in the pasture and uh, doesn't add to nitrogen excretion. The other component in lactation feeding is if it's being fed on platform, particularly if it's being grazed on platform, then the higher yield it is, the smaller the land area that has to be put aside in rotation for it. And you know the beet yields can be uh, extraordinary, particularly on high fertility platforms. It's a low footprint crop in terms of uh, nitrogen or phosphorus um, uh, uh, excess. And so in terms of nitrate leaching or in terms of uh, runoff, it's a relatively low footprint crop. It adds a lot of soil organic matter particularly at high stocking rates because the cattle are there turning over a lot of material. And it's easy to use in a lactation system because it can either be grazed or it can be lifted variously with beet buckets or commercial harvesters and then fed out on the pasture. We'll discuss both of them. Now it's worth noting that the transition in lactation is a very different beast than the transition in uh, dry cow feeding. In lactation you don't have the stick of being able to use um, feed withdrawal to get animals hungry to move them onto beet originally. So uh, when they're initially presented with that, there's an adaptation period that is particularly important in lactation feeding systems. And if that's missed, then it's really common to have 25 or 30% of the group that aren't eating bulbs at all. Now in lactation, they'll have a lot of other feed in their diet, their daily diet. So if you're not careful with that, or if they're determined around it, then they can always find something else to eat in that daily cycle. So what we put here is that they're simply, they're a lot fussier than the dry cows are, and you don't have the stick, you've only got the carrot. So the really important component of lactation feeding is that you start at a single kilo of dry matter, and you don't move off that until you're confident that all the cows are eating the bulb. And there's a few tricks to that, which we'll discuss in the next slide, but it's, it's a really important position that after that, you can move up one kilogram every two or three days, but don't move up away from that one kilogram until you're confident that the whole of the group are eating them. So that's the really strategic um, change in lactation feeding. As a general rule of thumb, once they're moving, um, you can then get them to about five kilograms of dry matter in a week. The, the classic on pasture diet, if they're eating uh, 17 or so kilograms of dry matter a day, then it'll be approximately one third of the diet is the maximum amount of beet that we would include in that. So that five kilogram, five to six kilograms comes from that figure. Now, if that uh, lactation feed is being used in grazing, then because they're, um, it's really important at that early stage to restrict the amount of beet they have right down to the one kilo, then it's more difficult to do that if you're using square meters. So wherever possible, we like to use that by having the hot wire as it is in the photograph in front of you, uh, directly in front of the rows. These animals have been on this a while, so there's more under their feet, 
but having that hot oil on the row means that you can titrate your allocation much more carefully. Um, as a general rule, uh, it's easier in lactation if they're using upright cultivars, they're not eating as much of it and they're often not there for as long. So they're not gonna chew them out of the ground. So upright and relatively soft cultivars are an advantage and they still have the same space requirements that we've discussed previously of one meter per animal along that face. If you tighten up on that, you push all the young animals out the back and then you create problems for them and for the overeaters that take their place. And the other important component, maybe the most important component in lactation feeding is, to, and uh, there, again, there's some very poor information uh, on this, is that you should start them on that one kilogram when it's being introduced at the, the daily cycle where they're the hungriest. So use their appetite to your advantage to move on that. So sometimes you hear that you should fill them up with grass or fill them up with supplement or something as a way to stop rumen acidosis. No, that's, it's not required and it's counterproductive. You should start them on that one kilogram at the time when they're the hungriest in their daily cycle. And that means that you have to allocate well. If you're allocating well, then that dry matter intake's not an issue. Um, and by, <clears throat> by starting them when they're hungry rather than when they're full, what it means is that you can switch the whole mob on to beet eating a lot quicker. After about seven days, once if they're appropriately managed, after about seven days, there's a switch that changes in their head and they really like beet after that and then they'll chase it. So once you've switched the whole mob onto that at relatively low levels, then it's an easy uh, job to move them up. It's difficult if you haven't done that. Some practical bits and pieces are that you can break up the bulbs to begin with. So uh, the shy feeders will work out the sugar inside it pretty quick and just running the tractor over it works well. And rather than uh, put them on for a short time and take them off, you leave them on right from the start, even though there's nothing there. They might eat it in 10 minutes if it's one kilogram sometimes, but you leave them on that crop for that one to two hours so that they understand you're not coming to get them back out. They're very good on time, so they work it out really quickly. So leaving them on that is the way to um, push more and more of them onto that feed. And then the final one is if it is being grazed like that, you have to be careful of gateways and mud because there's a lot of splash if they're walking into it. And it has been associated in some cases with an increase in somatic cell count. Now only two problems that you really have in lactation feeding are uh, transition acidosis. And you would think if they're being limited at five kilos, that would, automatically that's not a problem. But if there's 25% of the animals that aren't eating that five kilos, there's another 25% who are now eating 10. And 10 kilos in lactation uh, diet is very different to 10 kilos in the dry cow diet uh, when they're lactating. And so that second component comes in, if, if you are intending to feed over five kilograms of dry matter a day, then there's some other uh, dietary components that have to have more attention paid to them. Uh, in particular, the total crude protein of the diet, the amount of fiber that's being fed, and the calcium and phosphorus uh, intakes, all of which are much uh, stronger outputs in lactation than they are in the dry cow. So here's some things not to do on a practical level. Um, it's much easier with a soft upright cultivar. So the hard deep cultivars to start with are not that, generally not that palatable, they don't take to them as quickly. So it's often easier to transition them onto the upright types. Transition by time is a really bad idea. You get some, and all animals will nearly eat the leaf, and then you get some animals that'll eat quickly onto the bowl, and a lot that won't. And if you're starting them with, say, 20 minutes the first day, you can guarantee there'll be a large number of them that don't eat anything at all. Now, as that goes up, some of them will take to it, and then they move up too fast, and you've got some at the beginning who took to it, and they've got a greater allocation because some aren't eating it. Transition by time is a very common cause of uh, problem on farm. We highly recommend that it isn't done. We've talked about the length and uh, not cramping them up and the fact that they need to have more time on it. If you get them up to five kilos and you're in a hurry and they know you're coming back in an hour to take them out again, then they change the way they eat and they can push themselves into uh, a poor room and function. But they're very conscious of the time. And as we said before, don't feed them before you're starting because you get a, a large group then that will never get onto it. And as, as a general rule of thumb, if you haven't got that group onto them uh, after about two weeks of lactation, you won't get them on otherwise. And then the other one is just not moving those allocations up too fast. <clears throat> if you're instead using harvested beet, like in the example here, then what would happen is it'd be picked up by the beet bucket 
and that we've put out across the pasture. So in this case, it can be more of a challenge in the transition. Uh, the first thing is um, don't use book values. So if you're going to put those weights out, then be very careful that you get real dry matters before you're using them. Now, the, the space still uh, has a role to play in the paddock. So you have to put it out differently than you would be putting out silage on the grass. You have to drive faster and spread things out more. The, the way that they eat these is that they tend to stand in position. So they stand there for a longer period of time. So they, if, if there's not that space between them, then the lighter and shyer animals get pushed away. So you really have to spread it out on the ground. <clears throat> and the other um, practical component is if you're putting it out after milking and it's, you, you're putting it out on the paddock and then you're taking the cattle back to it, you have to put a hot wire up to keep the mob off the beat until the whole mob's there. Otherwise, the first ones that come out onto it uh, can have whatever they like and they'll uh, eat themselves into problem. And the ones that come later get nothing at all. So a hot wire will be put up and then it'll be released so the whole mob goes on to the, where the beat is. Transition uh, on the pasture can be a little trickier. And going back to what we said before, it becomes very important to use uh, appetite in that cycle. Now, smashing them up for a couple of days certainly helps. This is what the beet buckets um, look like. And they're normally just put out through uh, a conventional silage wagon. Um, in most cases, these hold about eight tonnes of wet weight, um, which is approximately one tonne of dry matter. Here's what you shouldn't do with that, uh, putting them out on grass. Put them in large clumps where you know large numbers of cattle have to come and stand side by side. It's a guaranteed way to keep the lighter and shyer ones away. Make sure when you're starting that you don't give them a large feed or their daily break before you put them on beat. There'll be a group you never get onto it. And make sure that you're patient with it. And even though it's only five kilos, that you take your time getting up to the maximum. Are there any special requirements? Um, in most cases, um, vaccination for clostridial disease in mixed age adult dairy cows is not practice. And in most cases, it's not necessary. In a few cases, the losses are there, but in most cases, it's not necessary. They've normally got a pretty good immunity by uh, the time they're adult. Um, it's worth noting that they're not fussy at all in terms of the cultivar. Now, in, in lactation feeding, having an upright one has some advantage to you, but as a general rule of thumb in the dry cow feeding or in calf heifer feeding, they're not fussy at all. They'll eat all cultivars. The deeper ones, sometimes they'll leave some behind as in, in the ground, but, but they're not fussy. They're not like the younger stock. <clears throat> the protein requirement for that dry cow period at a maximum of 12 or 13% is really easily achieved. So the supplement yeah, isn't that important. The quality is, is not such an issue. And it's worth remembering that they're on uh, two kilograms a day um, minimum intake. So they really do require that for optimum function. And as a general rule, they're the quickest livestock class to get onto the beef. For lactating cows, again, vaccination is not really necessary. Remember, they're not um, particularly fussy if you're putting it out on the ground, but upright cultivars are there for grazing rather than for just putting it out on the ground. So if you're putting it out on the pasture, really they're not fussy, they'll eat all of the cultivars. And the lactation protein requirements of 16 or 17% are typically met by pasture if you're keeping to about one third of the diet. Um, there's no other supplement that's required, so you don't need to put hay or straw. In fact, you shouldn't do so. It will cost you intake and cost you milk. So there's no, no other supplement beyond the pasture that's automatically required. But remember, you don't have the stick, you've only got the carrot. So for the timing uh, of lactation, the transition to them, you need to be a lot more patient and use that daily appetite cycle to your advantage. And with that, I'm now gonna turn it over to Mark Jones to talk about replacement calves on beet. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. Yeah, so um, looking at replacement calves, uh, really what we're aiming to do is, is look at um, replacements of around 200 kilos uh, going on to the beet, which is generally fairly easily achieved uh, from using spring block calving. And really the, the target there is for a full winter for about 150 days, um, with a turnout probably into early or mid, mid March. And uh, the other thing we're aiming to do is uh, get them up to unrestricted uh, beet. Um, and then the really important point is to get that correct supplementation. So we're really looking at one kilo of dry matter, either from pasture or good silage. But um, good grass is 
probably the most important one. We're going to get slightly higher growth rates. Uh, but again, if that's not possible, then we're looking at very good silage. So we're talking you know, 11 to 12 ME silage with uh, high protein, but it's it's that, that extra protein we're going to require uh, for, for these R1s. Generally, we're, we're aiming for daily growth rates of between 0.65 and a kilo a day, daily lightweight gain. And uh, research um, on brassicas, um, particularly kale in New Zealand, suggested that um, you know growth rates have been as low as 150 grams a day. So the potential here for fodder beet compared to brassicas is, is much improved. This then makes um, the ideal daily live weight gain for the, the life of that, that heifer to, to make mating uh, targets uh, very doable at that 0.75 kilos a day on average for active slime. Okay, next slide, please, Jim. Okay, so in terms of the age of the, the R1s, they can be as low as, as six months and, and up. And um, really what we're aiming to do is to increase those daily live weight gains, as we mentioned, uh, compared to previous crops such as, as kale or even old grass wintering uh, or even just keeping them on, on silage alone. So really we're aiming to creep those live weight gains up to three quarters of a kilo plus. Um, again, when we turn off the fodder beet in the spring, we're really aiming for uh, almost like compensatory growth. So those animals should be doing over a kilo a day of grass. Again, that sets us up into a, a brilliant position for, for mating to, to hit those breed targets. Um, and then the other side of it, um, if we feel that um, growth is a, a little bit higher, uh, when we come to the autumn and we're actually looking to put the R2s onto the fodder beet, we can actually reduce or throttle down uh, that daily live weight gain and keep a higher stocking rate um, on that fodder beet during that period. So then we're not getting uh, cattle in, in higher condition scores and then we're just preparing them ready uh, for calving later, later on in the spring. But really, um, the requirements, uh, again, for these are ones, uh, the most important part is clostridial vaccines. Of course, they haven't uh, built up any immunity at all. So again, you're looking at uh, two doses uh, about a month apart before they get onto the fodder beet. And then minerals is also very important for those younger cattle. So we're looking at selenium, cobalt, iodine, melted copper. So it's important to make sure we've got those supplements correct before we go onto, onto the fodder beet. And as we mentioned before, Pasture and grass is really the best option there. So it's given the, the highest quality supplements, um, high protein, uh, easily digestible. But again, if we can't provide that, we're then looking at uh, very high quality silage. In New Zealand, a lot of looser in silage can be used. So it's not always readily available in the UK, um, but you know, very good high quality silage is good enough. The other important point is uh, the R1s are going to be very fussy to transition to the crop. So we're probably looking at uh, near a three week period overall. And uh, we need to start that off particularly by sprinkling fodder beet out to grass for probably a full week before we actually start transitioning them, uh, transitioning them onto the crop itself. So we probably look to run over uh, some of that fodder beet to get them to, to get into the crop. And then we would um, adjust them um, at half a kilo a day uh, once we've got them onto the crop to full intakes. Okay, back to you. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, so what we're going to do now is uh, look at some myths that are around and a little bit of troubleshooting, see what goes wrong and uh, a summary checklist. So there's quite a, quite a lot of misinformation around beet, uh, particularly in the last few years. And if I were to rank them particularly with mixed age dairy cows, um, uh, uh, the most common would be very similar to the beef industry issues. And rumen acidosis and presented in different ways would be the top of that list. So sometimes it's spoken about as uh, you know true rumen acidosis for these otherwise well transitioned animals, which is nonsense. But sometimes it's it's done slightly differently where it talked about subclinical acidosis. 
And I'm familiar with most of that work and uh, the, the means by which that's been assessed is um, very unusual in most cases. And, the, and, and it's just simply not the case. But what's more important is that the, um, the, the remedies to these myths are often highly destructive. So for example, uh, along the lines of if rumen acidosis is going to be pre present in these animals, then your solution to it is to restrict the amount that they feed every day. Well, 50 or 60 years of uh, work in the North American uh, feedlots showed very clearly that restrict feeding changes intake and therefore produces some of the uh, dysfunctional rumens that we really don't want. Restrict feeding is never a good idea and uh, feeding other components of the diet higher um, can be uh, effective, but restrict feeding, particularly in mixed age dairy cows, just in, involves them in competitive eating behavior. Once they're on unrestricted feed and they understand that they can eat whenever they want, their intake pattern is changed. That's some work that Bernadita Saldias and myself published in 2015-16, that, that unrestricted intakes meant that their intake pattern across the day push their feeding out rather than um, tightening their feeding into that period immediately after the break. So in particular, restrict feeding is, is commonly associated with issues in New Zealand, in you know, wherever it's practiced. Um, the other responses to this are around supplement and that would normally be something along the lines of, oh, there's a greater supplement required or that they should have unrestricted supplement and uh, eat whatever they want. Similarly, it's not true, not helpful. In most cases, all it does is simply uh, pr reduce production. That might be live weight gain or it might be milk if it's done in lactation. And then occasionally you hear things that are required around rumen buffers. So, you know, there's a particular hot diet in this and so we should add this buffer or that buffer. We use none of them. And I'll be absolutely plainly, none of them are required. Rumen function in uh, high intake beet diets is quite peculiar. Been the subject of very specific research for a decade or more uh, in our research group. And uh, really they are very healthy, happy rumens that have a characteristically high rumen pH, not a low rumen pH. So the other myths that you hear about are that you have to use very high protein supplements, even in the dry cows, you don't. Uh, that 12 to 13% is um, adequate. In fact, that meets the standards around AFRC and the uh, North American NRC requirements. And similarly with calcium and uh, phosphorus, there's some figures there that are, that are often bandied around that they always need to have this supplementation. Well, actually, in most cases, they need, they'll never need calcium supplementation on crop. And it's relatively uncommon to require phosphorus supplementation if green feed is being fed. It's, it's only if it isn't that it becomes an issue. And I'll finish with these. Um, the, the fact is that they do like most winter crops. So it's the same with brassicas. They do have a, a relatively high soil intake and we've calculated this for many years. And it just simply is not an issue. They, they don't get tooth wear. Um, as an example, one of the uh, principal farms that was involved in uh, fodder beet work in New Zealand and the development of fodder beet and dairy was a farmer called Brendan Woods of Canterbury. And uh, Brendan's been feeding fodder beet as the primary diet for his thousand cows for about 13 years. And uh, he's been feeding the same, the same approach and uh, for our R1s, R2s and mixed age cows. The, the tooth wear is just simply a fallacy. Sometimes that soil intake is also expressed as gut damage, either in the rumen or the intestines. And again, it's just simply not the case. You don't see it. We don't see more disease as a consequence of that soil intake, or for that matter, trocellamin issues even. But in the UK, I hear occasionally that it um, is supposed to be associated with listeriosis. The fact is we just haven't seen that and we've certainly not seen it anywhere else in the world. And then the final two, uh, the, the, the crop uh, sometimes said to have a very high oxalate content and therefore the intake of those oxalates that causes various issues with calcium metabolism. Actually, uh, the, the winter fed crop in particular has a derisory amount of oxalate in the leaf and all of the rumens uh, contain a bacteria, an oxalobacteria that um, breaks down those oxalates relatively quickly. So even by the end of transition, the animals have a rumen that's adapted to eating it. We never see issues with oxalates. I want to be really clear on that. We just never see issues with oxalates. And uh, you know, there's a, a tremendous number of cows that have winter fed a primary diet of beet in New Zealand for the last 10 years. And then the final one we've already spoken about, which is 
transition uh, it can be effective by just simply increasing the crime or the time on crop every day. It's not effective and you can run into a number of problems you know, using that. Our final bit is our summary checklist and um, prior to going on to the crop, uh, these are the things to think about. Um, you can't undo paddock selection and your design for grazing. So if that's poor, then you work a lot harder to get a good result. And if it's good, it makes the rest of transition and then the rest of that season really easy. So we always put it at the top of the list and it was the first thing that was overcome and changed in, in the rise of beet in the New Zealand industries. Because rumen acidosis at transition and only at transition is the only genuine animal health issue that we have, the simple way to get around that uh, crop yield known and known properly and well, and again, I'll refer you back to the first webinar, and that the allocation as a consequence of that crop yield being known is, is appropriate. Now, if those two are done, and that means that the space is put in place for them and the proper dry matter allocation is done for them and the correct amount of supplement is done, um, the problems with beet uh, evaporate. It's a relatively straightforward process. No animals should have any animal health issues at all in their transition to beet and there's no requirement for them to do so. Now with that, we'll turn it over to questions. Um, be happy to take uh, questions from the audience. Okay, thank, thanks very much, Jim. So, um, the first question, um, is there a difference in the amount of material left behind uh, compared to beef animals, uh, I suppose, in terms of the utilisation? Uh, and really, what should you be looking at? Mm. Um, there is. Uh, with with the beef systems, uh, the profit made out of them is their daily live weight gain and their live weight gain simply tracks their intake. And it's a peculiar feed beet and it was one of the first things that we discovered with it, that it was very different to brassicas and root crops in general, that there was a very strong relationship between the residual that was left on the ground uh, 24 hours later and their total intake. Now that's not intuitive. You would think as long as there's some material there, animals could go and eat it. But, but it's real. And to achieve maximum intakes in beef animals where those small gains every day really mean something, you have to leave three days of beet on the ground. Now, I should be really clear, you haven't changed your utilisation. So your utilisation is still over 95% because they go back every, as you move further and further up the paddock, they're eating from behind, eating forward. So behind those three days, your utilisation is complete. But if you want to achieve those maximum intakes, you have to have three days on the ground. We don't have to do that with dairy cows. Um, the, replace, the calves, so the replacement dairy calves, we do follow that process mostly to keep intakes really high, but we certainly don't do that within calf heifers or mixed stage dairy cows. And the simple reason is that they're bred for intake. They eat a lot more aggressively and we don't need to chase the, um, the absolute maximum intakes over that period. It's no help to our system really to do so. Their gains on it are already strong, in some cases too strong for their body condition gains. So we, we don't need to chase that. So in general terms, uh, we work on about 10 or 15% of the bulb dry matter on the ground when you go to move the line the next day. Um, having said that, if there's a very small amount there, then sometimes you can be restrict feeding them and not know it. And that does change their intake pattern and is associated with some problems. So yes, there are some differences with it, but no, that's not changing your utilization. Your utilization is still very high. You're just leaving it for a couple of days behind you. In dairy cows, you don't have to do that. You only really need to leave it that day behind you. Okay, um, a nice simple one for you. I know you mentioned about um, taking analysis to the labs, but uh, what is one kilo of dry matter of fodder beets in approximate fresh weight? So, um, the, the dry matter of the leaf doesn't typically move a lot in an agronomically well managed crop. The dry matter of the leaf, if it's uh, cut and we standardize that cut. To, to take off the crown at the level of the lowest leaf. And the dry matter of the leaf generally will be around 12%. Now, if it's in autumn or uh, if there's it frozen in winter, that will change a little bit. As a general rule, an agronomically well-managed crop, that leaf won't change. 
But the dry matter of the bulb will change markedly. And not only does it change between cultivars, but it changes within that cultivar between paddocks, regions, and years. So for example, the, um, the very low dry matter mangles, um, I have held the same cultivar in my hand that was a 6% dry matter in the bulb, and I've held it in my hand when it was a 19% dry matter in the bulb. So you should be very careful when people say to you, uh, here's the value that this cultivar will have, it won't. And so for that matter, we always make a point in our allocation of getting uh, dry matters done. So I'm automatically nervous when asked that question, <laughs> what will the fresh weight be? The truth is, if it's an agronomically well-managed crop and you've got 75% bulb, then that bulb will change with a lot of factors. The dry matter of that bulb will change with a lot of factors. Having said that, if you had to pick a standard range, most of the bulb uh, will run from the early teens up to the late teens. So if you worked on uh, a figure of 15%, um, you'll be um, over allocating for some end and under allocating for the other end, but that would mean that you've got approximately seven kilograms of uh, wet weight for a kilogram of dry matter. I would strongly suggest it's, it's, it's routine in New Zealand to do this, routine in wherever we've uh, implemented these systems all around the world now, just get real dry matters done on the bulb, don't guess them, because uh, transition is a really important component of that system, and it can be upended by simple things like overestimating, or typically underestimating, what the dry matter of that bulb is. So we would always suggest that people did that and got an appropriate dry matter done. It's not particularly expensive given what you've invested in the crop and in the stock. And uh, next question, um, in muddy conditions, how much soil uh, can cows, well, can, there, can cows digestive systems cope with? Mm. There's no limit. The short answer to that one is there's, there's no limit. I mean, soil intake is never a problem. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll be absolutely clear on this. I worked in this area for um, directly for about 15 years and we measure soil intake in animals by measuring the amount of soil that's passed in the faeces and by the use of rumen fistula animals where we can evacuate all of the rumen contents and take all of the soil that's present out of the rumen. Um, soil intake is something that is uh, characteristically underestimated in a lot of winter feeding scenarios. So for example, the highest soil intakes can be achieved on twice daily moved short ryegrass covers in winter in wet and muddy conditions. They're stamping it up, they're bringing it up and they're eating it on the pastures that they have. The soil intake um, can be strong and uh, the soil intake in root crops in muddy conditions can often be more than a kilo a day. Um, it'd be calculated in some of these systems and remember these systems have been in place for many, many years now. So some of these systems, the total soil intake can be about the weight of the cow in an annual season. And um, more than a kilo of soil a day being eaten in uh, these winter grazing systems with a lot of root crops, so Swedes as well, for example, is not uncommon. Um, it, it's, it's a myth that it has an effect on its teeth and uh, any of them. And it's a myth that it interferes with trace elements um, in particular. And that's been something that we've looked at specifically for many years now, what the trace element rundown is across that winter period with and without supplementation, for example, um, despite really high soil intakes where in theory, the iron could be tying up some of those trace elements. It simply just doesn't happen. And it passes through the animal without any drama. And when we were looking in the early days, uh, specifically at the histology of the rumen lining in beet fed animals where this soil intake was high, it was completely normal. You just can't find a problem with that soil intake. Uh, I, I note that it's something that's um, brought up a lot more in the UK and Europe, uh, where people historically had a history of washing bulbs um, before they were fed in total mixed rations, for example. But uh, in these grazing scenarios, it's not a it's not an issue. Okay. Uh, next question: What is your preferred method of mineral supplementation? Uh, do boluses have enough ingredients? Mm. Well, um, boluses potentially can be very effective um, and it 
depends for the mineral supplementation it depends a little on your area and what's not there so in terms of trace element supply i mean some areas are simply uh, don't re don't require copper and um some areas do in new zealand there's a lot of uh, volcanic soils where selenium is really low in other areas of the world selenium is perfectly adequate and it's just not required so in terms of trace element it's important to get uh, appropriate local veterinary advice on what uh, that area is known for. What is important in terms of the supply of trace elements is the, the sure knowledge that in winter they will drink very little and at high intakes on beet, particularly the upright softer varieties which are favoured for grazing, their water intake is uh, three or four times what it would be in a normal uh, full intake lactation environment. So it's not uncommon for these cows to eat more than 100 litres of water a day. So it means that they're wildly, positively, but wildly overhydrated. Now in those cases, they can go for extended periods without drinking a mouthful, and they often do. So it's uh, not a good system to have that being put out in the water. Now trace elements and uh, magnesium, for example, and phosphorus in some cases, being put out in the water in lactation is very common in New Zealand and there's sophisticated systems that are effective to do so, but it's completely ineffective in winter. The, the other system that's really ineffective and could, is, is very dangerous in most cases is the use of lick blocks or, or mineral blocks that are so-called free choice or voluntary. So the idea is that they can go along if they, if they want to. They often contain some salt and some molasses. It's a very poor way of giving trace elements and particularly phosphorus uh, in those uh, restricted environments where phosphorus is a problem. And then remember, not all environments is it a problem, but in some cases, uh, it is true that phosphorus supplementation is required in mixed stage dairy cows. And those lick blocks have been demonstrated time and time again that uh, in, even in cases where uh, deficiencies have been artificially induced, the maximum proportion of the herd that will go to those lick blocks is about 80%. In the normal run of events, it's likely below 50%. So uh, despite putting salt and molasses in them and people seeing that some cows quite like them, on a herd basis, they're very ineffective way to do it. So uh, for trace elements, our normal policy would be to inject them prior to going on the crop. There's a number of um, proprietary preparations that uh, are able to be used in most countries that'll supply us uh, copper, selenium, uh, cobalt and iodine. Uh, in terms of um, medium term, uh, for phosphorus in particular, the boluses are normally not effective. The amount, if, if phosphorus is required as supplementation, the amount that's required is about nine grams of elemental phosphorus a day. And that is almost always done here by the use of dicalcium phosphate sprinkled across their supplementary feed. That's a very effective and extremely inexpensive way to supply phosphorus. And that would be the recommendation. Okay, uh, next question. Uh, this is to do with RTs transitioning. So, so far uh, they've had, uh, they've been run on and off uh, grass paddocks you know, for the first two weeks. And uh, now they've run out of grass. Um, so they've been introducing uh, grass silage, silage bales. Um, is that an issue? Yes. In fact, um, uh, for, for, as a sort of uh, slightly more sophisticated uh, troubleshooting um, feature, sometimes you can run into difficulties with that because what you want in that transition period is a very smooth and unhindered um, progression onto full intakes. And cattle can be like people sometimes that they, they don't like abrupt changes. So what we generally recommend is if if you have in mind for the non-beat component of the diet to be one particular feed or another, then you include that feed right from the beginning. So for example, let's just, we'll use the example of somebody with, uh, who wanted to use two kilograms consumed of a particular hay. Then in the transition period, as in this case, they may well have used pasture because it's cheaper and, and it's to be recommended to do so. But what we would ordinarily do is we would suggest that that two kilograms of hay was present in the diet right from the beginning. So two kilograms of hay plus the rest of their diet being pasture and then beet. Uh, 
rather than uh, going to the end of transition and then abruptly introducing a feed that a number of them may not uh, want to eat automatically. Um, particularly given that by the end of that transition period, they're typically on pretty high ME intakes. And so that's discretionary feed for them. And sometimes that can be a problem in the tail end of transition. Now, once they've been transitioned on and past that, so they're thoroughly transitioned up to full intakes, then the type of supplement really doesn't matter because even if it's withdrawn, you don't induce ruminacidosis. I, 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 that, I, I should be really clear on that. The solution to rumen acidosis on beet is not the amount of supplement. Uh, in the trouble cases that you see with rumen acidosis, uh, statistically, the overwhelming bulk of the deaths are at day seven to 10 in transition. Now, day seven to 10, every postmortem that you ever see for rumen acidosis death will be full of supplement, full. The rumen will be full of supplement. So the amount of supplement in the rumen plays no role at all in reducing the acid load that the rumen has to deal with. It's a, it's a common misconception that uh, that increased supplement makes them either insalivate more when they're chewing on it to swallow it or produces a rumination change that produces enough uh, salivary phosphates, et cetera, to completely buffer the acid load. No, it doesn't. The adaptation to that higher acid load is, is principally their rate of intake, learning to shovel that coal into the boiler, if you like. And then the second one are all the systems that remove that acid from the rumen. It's not entirely a buffering system. So in, in, the, in the properly transitioned animal, the supplement can be abruptly removed and it makes no difference at all. But in that um, tail end of transition, when they're probably not really at uh, unrestricted intakes and they're certainly at that period are not going to be completely transitioned onto the feed, then those abrupt changes in supplement can actually affect their intake of beet. And if they're removed from the diet, then it means that they'll either be hungrier and eat more beef and often eat it faster. Um, or in other cases, if it's particularly palatable, simply eat more supplement. So sometimes that can be a problem. And as a strategy um, for, for next time, it's to include whatever you wanted uh, at the end right from the start. But in the circumstances, if it was good quality grass silage, and in most animals, the intake of that will, will not be a problem. So if they've been on grass and then they're moving over to that silage, as a general rule, you wouldn't expect to see too many issues. But as a principle, you better to include whatever you're gonna have at the end, right from the beginning. Okay, uh, what would be the maximum intakes uh, for, a, for a dairy cow on the side of beef? So this is really well established uh, right from the beginning and it's very dependable whether you have mixed stage cows uh, in chaff heifers, whether you have bulls, so uh, dairy beef bulls that are, are used on it, whether you have steers, uh, whether you have calves. It's an interesting peculiarity of beet that on maximum unrestricted intakes, where the supplements carefully manage to maximise the beet intake, they won't eat more than about 2.2% of their live weight in dry matter of beet every day. So for example, the, the classic 550 kilo animal uh, won't eat more than 12 kilograms of beet dry matter a day in no matter what you do. If, if And in the past, we've done this reasonably carefully. If you type them uh, towards the end of transition, so over the period beyond 14 days and that period where they're just adapting to complete and unrestricted intakes, if they're particularly low body condition animals, for a week or so, they'll temporarily raise that by about a kilo, but then they'll fall back onto the line. So that 2.2% of their intake is a really dependable figure. And that's an interesting question because you hear all the time, in fact, it, it, um, in years past, it was very common in the rural media that um, people would report their intakes. And you know they would report they had these intakes of 16 or 17 kilograms of beef. Of course, the intake that they're reporting is on the basis of a crop yield that typically they've been given by somebody else and their allocation is on the basis of that. It's simply not true. There's a very firm fixed upper limit of 2.2% of their live weight every day. And it's a dependable one. In fact, you can work the crop yields back in reverse using mixed age cows moving across that crop. It's a very dependable figure. Are there any protocols uh, you should be following uh, when transitioning them off the beet back to grass? No. Um, again, that's another uh, common misconception and, and you hear it occasionally. Uh, probably in recent years, more than we did in the early stages, 
Um, there, so I'll be absolutely plain for the audience on this one. There is no transition back to grass. The transition on to beet uh, is uh, a number of things. First and foremost, they have to either learn to or remember to eat bulbs. So with all the associated uh, chewing behaviours that are required for them to eat bulbs. The second one is that despite them having been on it for years, in the case of mixed stage cows and wintering, they can, in the case of Brennan Woods, 13 years. So, you know, every cow in that herd would have been on beet the previous year. They still take a period of about seven days before they get enthusiastic appetites for beet. So it's a myth sometimes that um, people think that they automatically love beet and they go on to it. No, they don't. After a week or so, they do. And they really like it and they'll chase it. But in that first week, they are moving back onto, um, on, onto it again. So that transition policy is really about them learning to eat that beet and then learning the rate of intake of that beet for appropriate room and function. Now there's some particular room and changes around the microbes. There's some room and changes around how the blood flow to the wall of the room and removes a lot of the uh, volatile fatty acids. So the energy rich substrates that are produced from those fermentable carbohydrates and they're important and they do take that 14 and sometimes slightly longer period. But the transition policy onto beet is around them modulating that rate of intake and it's about animal health and it's about not overloading the rumen. When they move off the beet back onto grass, there are no such issues at all. Technically speaking, there's some dietary changes that mean that there's a period of production adaptation, if you want to term it like that, where they'll achieve uh, maximum optimised efficiency after a period, but, but that's a very quick period. So where we look at the most aggressive beet feeding systems, which are in beef steers, um, they will have been on 90% uh, plus beet with a small amount of grass for 150 days and uh, commonly occurs in uh, these New Zealand systems for rising one-year-old beef weaners being finished on beet. And in the middle of spring, when the grass is deemed appropriate and they've got enough, they will be abruptly transitioned away from the beet on a single day. They'll leave the beet and they'll go on to grass. And where we've done intakes and live weight gains on those, their live weight gains immediately go up and their intakes immediately go up well above the 2.2% that we achieve on beet. So it's a, it's a complete myth that you need a transition back onto grass. It's something that's um, been promulgated by a series of consultants who really had very little uh, experience with beet. There is no transition back onto grass. Okay, just um, the, the final question, Jim. Um, in terms of uh, beet, can it be used in a TMI diet and what kind of seed levels would you be aiming at? Mm. So we, we uh, kept away from the use of beet in TMR diets, which of course has been done both in the UK and in uh, Europe and North America for some years. But in recent years, there's uh, a renewed interest in it on the basis that farms can grow it. Uh, it gives them a little bit more food security and of course it's much cheaper than most of the cereal grains. And the, the short answer is yes, you can use it and you, and you can use it easily and well. As a general rule of thumb, the, the bulb, so the, the leaf is less important in a total mixed ration in most cases because it's providing protein that'll commonly be provided in another form in TMR rations. So it's the bulb mostly that's used. And that bulb uh, is of a similar ME to most of the cereal grains and has either a greater or similar fermentable carbohydrate content. In the case of grains, that's going to be in the form of starch, of course. In the case of beet, it's going to be in the form of sucrose and sugars. If there was a rule of thumb with that, then the beet will um, quickly and easily replace half of the grain in that ration with almost no discernible effects in terms of either milk yield or uh, milk fat or protein changes. In fact, there's, there's a, a series of studies that have been done um, in Europe and North America for some years looking at the effect of sugar and by and large, they're positive effects. There's no negative effects at all that uh, are generally attributed to uh, increasing sugar in TMR diets. Um, in most cases, if it's done to half the level of the half the level of the uh, grain that's there, then what you find is really no change at all in the milk. The real value therefore is in the um, cost savings that beet can achieve. Okay.
Brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Jim, for tonight. So um, I'd just like to, to say uh, that we've now got uh, two more left in the series of uh, Fogbeat uh, webinars. So we've got um, Sheik on the, the 2nd of November and we've got the Economy one on the 9th of November. So again, thank you very much for your participation tonight and uh, the lots of questions. Again, uh, thank you very much, uh, Jim, and uh, hopefully we'll see you and meet a few more again on the, the 2nd of November. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.